about one minute after. Would you stand with me, please? The song is entitled, There's a New Name Written Down in Glory. And uh, has your name been written? That's good. I knew Herb was around here somewhere. Let's sing it. We'll sing all three verses. I was once a sinner, but I came pardoned to receive from my Lord. This was freely given, and I found that He always kept His word. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. And the white-robed angels sing the story. A sinner has come home, for there's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven, never more to roam. Keep up with me back there, Jack. All right. Folks are not, I'm singing a solo, all right? Let's do verse number two. I was humbly kneeling at the cross, fearing not but God's angry frown. When the heavens opened and I saw that my name was written down, there's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. And the white-robed angels sing the story. A sinner has come home, for there's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven nevermore. Before we sing the third verse, will you turn and greet one another and we'll come back and sing that last verse in just a minute. in your places. Let's sing the third verse all together. In the book tis written. Let's sing. In the book tis written, saved by grace. Oh, the joy that came to my soul. Now I am forgiven and I know by the blood I am made whole. There's a new It's mine, oh yes, it's mine. And the white robed angels sing the story. A sinner has come home. There's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. Sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven. that if you don't have a good gulp of air in your lungs that song's hard to sing but it's got a great truth and message right amen Amen. junior lugo back from traveling the world or at least traveling the northeast part of the country uh would you lead us in prayer please
Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for coming out on a Wednesday evening and for Bible study. It says a lot, and I sure do want to express my appreciation to you, and thank you for being here. We want to take just a few prayer requests before we have our Bible study, and, uh, and if you have some updates on the ones that we have been praying for, I did get ju- uh, a message just a few moments ago. Um, Mr. Don Canada uh, said, uh, my mom's in the hospital, um, and he gives the room number, and if you need, uh, if you'd like to see her, I can give you that privately. He said, mom's in the hospital, we need prayers. Don't know yet what happened, but I was at physical therapy and came out to the waiting room, and she was sweating and lethargic. Think she may have had a minor stroke. Uh, we'll find out tomorrow, so please be in prayer for Don's mom. Um, all right, any, uh, any other new prayer requests tonight? Uh, Brother Glenn? Oh, really? Okay. Share for him, for him. Um, okay. Oh, who, anybody know Don's mom's name? Mary. Mary. Okay. Okay. Other new prayer requests tonight? Yes, ma'am. Miss Evelyn? An unspoken one. All right. Anybody else have one tonight? Yes, ma'am. Update? Uh huh. Yes. Okay. Okay. If you didn't hear that, Melissa and Cynthia's dad uh, potentially going to be having a pacemaker put in. And uh, so please, John Duby? Duby. Other prayer requests? Is that Wyatt? Hey, Wyatt, you got a prayer request? Okay, what did he say? <laughs> you have friends coming to your house, traveling. I'm praying for safety for them as they travel to your house. Oh, okay. Uh, do these friends have kids? Oh, yeah. Wyatt wants them there safely. <laughs> All right? All right. Deborah's doing better, but she still can't go without the oxygen very long at a time. Okay. And her medicine is helping her. It is not? Oh, it is. Okay. All right. She's been on the leave. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sure. Okay. Yes, sir? Okay. Okay, pray for the Larry Heber family. All right. Okay, any others tonight? Yes, sir, Brother James? Uh, I talked to Joe Lee for Sunday. Uh huh. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sure. When are the beavers getting back? Do you know? Did he say? 
the beavers? Did he say when they're heading back into Yuma? Oh, okay. In about a month. All right. Who was it that was here? Miss Julie was here. Yeah, she said she was here, and then she's getting. And then she's going back north where it's cooler. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Miss Lydia? Oh, good. Yeah. Will you please uh, send me her phone number? All right. Okay. All right. Any others? Yes. Keep Melissa. My Melissa? Yes. Oh, okay. She's back there. Your mama wants us to pray for you. And she's uh, having blood work done. Um, may I share? Okay. Oh, you got your results back today. I didn't, you all heard it when I heard it. All right. Did you say rheumatoid arthritis? Is that what you said? Okay. Okay. All right. Any others? All right. Brother Herb, would you lead us in prayer, please, sir? Thank you, Brother Herb. We have been talking about the Hebrews, uh, the Hebrews, the heroes found in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11. And uh, I, uh, um, we, we talked uh, first week, uh, first uh, uh, last week about Abel, and uh, we saw where Abel, um, he, um, the Bible said about him that yet he is dead, yet he speaks. Um, and so we learned about Abel's life that, um, or through Abel's life, what's required of us to be acceptable in the eyes of God. And uh, if you remember what, uh, what it is that God requires of us to be accepted in, or accepted by God, do you remember? Oh, wow. Okay, here we go. Hebrews chapter 11 is called the great... Yeah, there you go. Oh, so I wonder what's required uh, to be accepted by God. Amen. There you go. And uh, just needed... I, I bragged on you last time and talked about how smart you were. Oh, maybe I need to rescind. No, I won't do that. I don't want to do that. Well, to, this evening, I want us to look at the next one on God's list of heroes as we've <clears throat> been going through this. And tonight we're going to look at Enoch and uh, Enoch or Enoch. We're going to see his walk, his witness, and his rapture. 
And you really can't talk about Enoch without talking about um, the rapture of the church. And we'll um, see why here in just a, a few moments. Um, Hebrews chapter 11, um, as we go through this, we realize and we begin to understand um, that faith, faith really should govern every part of our lives. Faith should be a part of our everyday living. And that faith should cause us to, um, it should be involved in the decisions that we make. Our understanding of who God is and, and, uh, and his involvement in our life should cause you and I uh, to make de- decisions differently than someone, say, without faith. And so Hebrews chapter 11, talking about that as we approach this man, Enoch, um, the Bible uh, speaks of him is really a, a mystery uh, about Enoch. I want you to see here Enoch the mystery man. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 5. The Bible says by faith uh, Enoch or maybe Enoch however you want to say it. The emphasis there. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he what? He pleased God. By faith, Enoch was taken to heaven while still alive. That, I think, would be, I don't know how to say it. That would be really cool. That would be really cool to get to go to heaven and not have to go through the doorway of death. Um, No death, just gone. Just, hey, where's Enoch? I don't know. You check. Sam's place? No. You checked over at Mama's house? No. Where, where's Enoch? I, I, I don't, let's, let's look for him. No death, just suddenly he was gone. Um, uh, you might even say it would be the ultimate in the beam me up Scotty. I mean, he's just any Trekkies in here. The Bible says that he could not be found, indicating that they looked for him. That, that there was a search party put out. An, an APB was, was put in, in, the, in the motion there. Where? Where is Enoch? So a huge mystery. Don't you know? All of a sudden, somebody just disappears off the face of the earth. And you got to know that, that he was a, um, a man of great notoriety. It, it wasn't like just some sideline guy who maybe no one might miss. But he was someone of renown. And yet, uh, suddenly he's gone. Now, uh, next part I want us to look at verse number 6. Following verse number 5, obviously. But we always uh, quote verse number 6 by itself. Or we read verse number 6 by itself. Uh, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, we like Hebrews chapter 11. But if you read Hebrews chapter 11 in context, it's in relation to Enoch. And we just use it as a standalone verse oftentimes as we're looking for uh, an understanding of faith or, or how we please God. It's done by faith. But it's, it's still talking about Enoch's life. Enoch was the one that pleased God. How was it that Enoch pleased God? Was he more holy? Was he more zealous? Did he... Did he read his Bible more than everybody else? Did he pray more than everybody else? Did he, did he go to synagogue more than anybody else? No. Again, the same way that we learned about Abel, that he was accepted to, acceptable to God by what? Likewise, Enoch pleased God by faith. So how are we going to please God? By our good works? By any good thing that we can do? Does that mean we shouldn't do good things? No. Our faith should lead to good things. And folks, that's important. It's important that we understand that our faith, as James chapter 2, verses 14 down through 21, teaches us that our faith without works is dead being alone. In other words, the people can't see faith. All they can see is works. But if our works are not married or coupled or do not have a basis in faith, 
they are absolutely uh, useless. They are they are of they are of, uh, of they're void. They're they're null of purpose. So as we look at um, verse number six, but without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a re- rewarder of those that diligently uh, seek Him. We see that it was Enoch's faith that pleased God. So. In your life and in my life, how important is faith in our walk or life with God? Would you say it's important? Okay, you said very, right? How about so much so that it is impossible to please God? It's not that it's just hard. It's not that it's uh, that you could replace it with with something else. It's not that it's just you, you're probably not going to please God without faith. No, God says it is impossible to please God without faith. That puts a whole nother level of importance on our understanding of how our faith is. We think, well, I don't curse, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't gamble, and and I don't date the girls that do, and so, or is it, is it, if you're in the South, and I don't chew, and I don't date the girls that do, that's how you get it to rhyme, and, uh, and we think that makes us pretty good persons. We think that, oh, wow, I'm a, you know, I ain't killed nobody. God's probably going to look at me with favor. God's going to look at me with, uh, with, with a sense of, you know, he's, he's a good guy. Look at, I mean, he, he, he's faithful, and he's be diligent. Goodness, he's even in church on a Wednesday night, a Wednesday night of all things. <laughs> and we see here in this verse that all of these things, though they're good, it is faith. It is faith. And it is only faith by which we can please God. Amen. Now again, don't misunderstand. Faith is working faith. Truth, Bible faith, it is working faith. And so I, tonight I want us to, to, to look again. I want us to uh, re-examine again our own hearts and say, how much do I live by faith? How many decisions today did I make in light of God? That's what it means to live by faith. To live by faith is to say, there is a God and he should make a difference in my life. And... Therefore, how, you can examine again your, your day, your week, how many decisions, what things did I do today that I did those things because I believe there is a God. I must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. Well, I can tell you one real big one right now unless, you know, your mom or daddy made you come here. And that is you came to Bible study. By coming to Bible study, you're saying, you're making the statement, I believe there's a God. And I want to come hear his word preached. And I want to hear it taught. And I want to learn more of his word. And I want to diligently seek him, believing that he's going to reward me for it, as the Bible says right there. And so, yes, we do make our decisions in faith. That's what it is to live by by faith. I like the, uh, the quote written by... Uh, Charles Henry McIntosh, who said that faith glorifies God exceedingly because it proves that we have more confidence in his eyesight than our own. I've said before, so many times we may find ourselves in a difficult situation and we try to figure it out on our own. We try to reason it out. We try to logic it out. We try to wrap our mind around it when in reality God says, would you trust me with that? My eyesight is not diminished. My eyesight is perfect. I can see from the beginning to the end. I know all of what's going on in that situation. God says, trust me, lean not to your own understanding. And that is, again, believing that his eyesight is better than our own. So when we are in a difficulty, what's, what should we do? We should have the idea that says, though I do not see the way forward, clearly there is one who does have perfect sight, and his sight has never failed or it's never diminished, and he'll guide me, and I will rest in him. I will trust in him. 
The first step to victory comes by saying, though I do not see clearly, I'm going to trust in God. I'm going to trust in God. You know, it's kind of the simple childlike faith. Hey, um, come and uh, get in the car with me. And the kid says, okay. Believing mom and daddy can drive the car, take the kid where he needs to go. Or, okay, I'm down here. Jump, I'll catch you. You know, and a kid will do that, right? That simple childlike, childlike trust, childlike faith. Uh, those of us a little bit older, we lose that childlike faith. We often like, well, uh, I'm not too sure about you. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not so, you sure you're going to, you're not going to play a trick on me. It's that childlike faith. And that's really, if you think about it, I don't know about you, but I'm often marveled by the fact that God would be pleased with me or that God would be pleased with fallen man. And I know the sinfulness of man. I know the sinfulness of man's heart. And as a result of that, I often marvel at the fact that God would be pleased with any of us. And yet this is the way in which God is pleased with us. When we simply say, I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. This situation I find myself in, Lord, I believe that you can get me through it. I believe that you can uh, help me in this situation. I trust in you. Now, I want us here to not only see uh, his walk, but I want to uh, hit the, um, let's see, uh, about how to please God. But also I want us to see Enoch's walk. Look at Genesis chapter 5 and verse number 21. The Bible says Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. And after he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Tremendous story there. Tremendous uh, event that occurred there. I like what one old preacher said about Enoch in his translation. He said, Enoch took long walks with God. And one day, Enoch and God were walking, and they walked so long that God said to Enoch, Enoch, you're, you're closer to my home than your own. Why don't you just come on home with me? And uh, I like that. I, 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 I want to emulate that in my own walk. And I think all of us who, who have a desire to, as the Bible said, diligently seek him, is to, to be close to the Lord. And I like that. So what does it mean to walk with God? Well, the Bible says that even all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, where Adam and Eve were in the garden, that they heard the Lord walking in the garden. So you get the idea that mankind before sin, we were created with the ability and even purpose to be in fellowship and spend time with God. And that before the fall, I don't know how long it was that Adam and Eve lived before the fall, but before that occurred, you get the picture that God and Adam and Eve spent time together in fellowship walking in the garden. I don't know if that was weeks or months or years or millennium. I have no idea, but I do know that they walked with God in, in the coolness of the day, the Bible says. And so you get the idea that God desires, and that's what Christianity is all about, God desires for you and I to have a walk or a fellowship or a relationship with him like it was before the fall, like it was when he had that relationship with Adam and Eve. But what does that mean? What does it mean to walk with God? Uh, Sebastian, come here a minute. I don't, I don't need you, I need your help. Sebastian and I are going to walk together. Now, several things have to happen. If we're going to walk together, then, then we need to go in the same direction. Ready? Here we go. <laughs> yeah, that's why I chose Sebastian. This is often what happens. We walk and we fall behind. Or we can get ahead of God. Go ahead of me. I'm going to play God in this position. That's terrible. And, uh, and, and we take things into our own hands. And we, we don't, walking with someone, okay, now stay right here beside me, means, number one, we're going to go in the same direction. We're going to agree at the pace in which we're going. Usually for there to be a good walk, and 
Uh, some of you husbands and wives may go on a walk together. And you're going to have fellowship. So there's chatting and talking. Talk to me. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> have a seat. And we walk together. So there's the, there's the agreement of, of where we're going. There's the agreement of, of how fast we're going. But the real thing is, is that the walk, it's, it's, I mean, you may walk for exercise. I get that. But when you're walking with someone, if you're going on a walk with someone, the whole idea is fellowship. Right? The whole idea is, you, hey, let's take a walk together. Okay? So, fine. But if you just walk and, you know, and you don't do any talking, you know, that's, you can get back to, and somebody's going to think, well, they must be upset with me or something. Because, and the whole idea of walking with God is just that. It is being in fellowship with God. It is spending time with God. It is getting on God's page. Can I tell you, when you walk with God, you don't set the pace. And when you walk with God, you don't set the direction. And when you walk with God, you don't even choose the conversation. He does all of those things. And when you walk with God, God leads us and he guides us. And the whole idea is to get on his page and agree with him in all the areas of life as we spend time in fellowship with him. I ask you a question tonight. Does your walk sound like the kind of walk where like a, a newlywed, they just can't wait to, he gets off work. Oh, she's thinking. He, he's on his way home. And he texts, I'm on my way home. Um, or I remember when my wife and I were dating, I don't know if we had text messaging back in the, those days, but we had, we had cell phones. And uh, we didn't text message, and that was before Facebook. Imagine a day. And, uh, but I remember we would, um, I would leave her home, and she lived about 35, 40 minutes away from me. And I would drop her off after having a date, and I would, I would drive back home, and, and I'd be on the phone with her the whole time, all the way there. And I'd go in the house, and... and uh, uh, and, and still be on the phone with her. And I'd get ready for bed, and I'd lay the phone down on, on the counter in the bathroom, and I'd still be on the phone with her. And I'd turn off the light in the bathroom, and I'd finally get to the bedroom, and I'd still be on the phone with her. And I'd lay in the bed, and I'd turn off the light, and I'd still be on the phone with her. And we'd be talking, and eventually it would, be, it would end like this. Hey, are you there? Are you there? Uh, uh, yeah, 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 I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> well, okay, yeah, I, I'll talk to you tomorrow, okay? Love you, bye. You know, that sort of thing. The idea was we just, we just wanted that communication, just desired to just spend the... When I was in Bible college, I, um, everything was about 40 minutes away. The Bible college I attended was about 40 minutes away. She would get in the car and ride with me all the way to Bible college, and I would go to class for three hours as she sat in the parking lot in the car doing other things, maybe homework for uh, high school, and we started dating, and I was in college, and she was in high school. I married, I robbed the cradle, but anyway, <laughs> and then when she was in college, she, uh, she would be doing homework and all, but, but why did she do that for that 40-minute trip there? And that 40-minute trip back, just that spending time together. And as you can tell, lately, we hadn't spent a lot of time. I learned about the rheumatoid arthritis at the same time you did. And uh, very, very busy, busy times. But, but it's, that, it's that sweet desire to have fellowship, to enjoy one another's company. Folks, as neat as that story may sound to you or as corny as it may sound to my kids, uh, our sweet fellowship with the Lord ought to be that and so much more. Amen. And our heart's desire, they that diligently seek him, the Bible says, he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Yes, sir. Christ, Christ gives us a perfect example in 11, 28, when he says, take my yoke upon you so that we do walk together at the same speed, the same pace. 
That's right. The, a yoke, of course, being an instrument, a, a tool where, where two, two, um, two livestock are working together, plowing together. That's right. And so the idea of there is serving, of course. Um, in Enoch's day, you got to know there weren't all the, the distractions. Have you ever noticed how easy it is to get distracted in your prayer time? You know, you, you in your prayer, or even in, I've talked with the parents of the teenagers and I asked them, I said, hey, would you help, help me by having either your kids leave their cell phones, your teenagers leave them in the car or put them in their pocket, but don't get them out because it's so easy. I learned how easy it is to get distracted at teen camp. We were at teen camp and the preacher was preaching there and I, uh, and I had a, a notification come up on my phone. I was using my phone as my Bible app. And so I, I but, and I had the Bible app open, you know, honest, and there's this notification. Hmm, I better check out and see what that is. <laughs> Click on that there. Huh? 10 minutes later, sermon's been going on 10 minutes later. Oh, I'm back in tune with what's being preached there. And I realize, cause I don't have, you know, I don't experience what you experience. I don't realize how easily it is to get distracted. There are so many distractions. I saw some statistics. Uh, Jackson, show me those statistics. 81% of Americans now own a smartphone. 81% of Americans now own a smartphone. Give me the next one. 93 million selfies are taken every single day. And can I tell you, that, that statistic is three years old. That was as of of uh, uh, 2016. I'm sure it hasn't decreased. Okay. 90 mi- You get the idea that we are very much and have become very much a self-absorbed, very self-centered people. You, have you ever noticed that the old pictures, the old black and white pictures, when they look kind of brownish white and the old pictures, that nobody smiled? You ever notice that? All the pictures is because... They just didn't do that. It was a, it was a, a stern countenance. And, and a picture was just something that, you know, it's just, it's not something that you did every day, you know. But now 93 million um, selfies are taken every day. Here's an interesting statistic. Show me the next one. More people died last year taking selfies than were killed in shark attacks. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, and this, this is a uh, 2016 statistic, so that would have been 2015. Uh, more people kill. You say, how does that happen? I, I saw just last year, I think it was at the Grand Canyon, yeah. taking a picture. <laughs> ah, 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 you know, we kind of laugh, but it wasn't, wasn't funny to them on that day. Show me the next one, Jackson. On Snapchat, 74% of the images shared are selfies. And then this last one, 168 hours each year taking selfies. That is seven days out of the year taking pictures of ourselves. (laughs) Seven days out of the year are spent doing this. Well, when... That's not my good side. Raise my, raise my chin so my double chin disappears here. There you go. Seven days. I, do you get the idea that we are very distracted? You go into a waiting room. You go to any place. You have to wait in line for 10 seconds. You're sitting at the red light. You know? You, you, I have to say... I'm guilty. You sit in the, in the waiting room someplace. I don't like sitting in the waiting rooms anyway. I think doctors ought to have more respect for my schedule. But anyway, <laughs> nobody talks. Everybody's like this. What's wrong with me? I'm going to Google it, figure it out right here. Self-diagnosis here. And, you know, um, we're very distracted and we're very self-focused. But that was not the case in Enoch's day. Enoch was a man who diligently sought the Lord. I'm not opposed to technology. Look at this. Obviously, I am not opposed to technology. Yet, I see the ills of 
allowing technology to eliminate this conversation and fellowship with one another and this, my relationship with the Lord. Um, by the way, one hint, if you get easily distracted in your prayer time and in your Bible reading time, um, uh, if, if it's, uh, don't use a Bible app if it's going to be distracting to you. Secondly, have you a pen and paper and write, if you're praying and you think, oh, I need to take care of that, and then your mind runs that way a thousand miles an hour in the opposite direction, pen and paper, write it down, set it aside, go back to what you're praying about, Okay. And then if you'll do that for long, you'll have your whole schedule for the day over here on this piece of paper. Thinks, oh, I forgot about that. Oh, I forgot. And you'll start praying and you'll think, oh, you know, I need to send a note to. And I need to go visit so-and-so. And I need, to, I need to send an encouraging word to. And you just write a note over here and you lay it to the side. We're very distracted and we're very self-focused. Um, so we need to walk with God. And we've said, what does it mean to walk with God? It means to be in fellowship with God. It means to be in a relationship with God. It means to pursue the things that God is pursuing. And it means to recognize what God has done for us. You know, our motivation for, for walking with the Lord, our motivation for being in fellowship with Him is to go all the way back and realize what He did for us. You know, if you say, well, I don't feel close to the Lord. Then you haven't spent enough time thinking about Calvary. Is I don't feel like I, I, I'm drawn to the Lord. I, I want to love the Lord, but I, to be honest with you, Pastor, I just, it's just not there. You need to spend more time at the cross. You need to spend more time thinking about the sacrifice that was paid for you. That is, you got to say, ah, it's got to be more than that. No, it's not. That is the ultimate driving force. That is the ultimate motivation for your and my devotion to the Lord. Is the cross. It's Calvary. It's understanding that I was at odds with God, but God has brought me close by the Son. It's understanding that one of my sins, just one of my many, many billions of sins, just one of those would have been enough to send me to hell. But all of my sins have been forgiven by the sacrifice of the Son, the blood that was shed. It goes back to realizing who He is. And what he's done for us. I saw a story that illustrates this. You can learn a lot from a penguin. Dindim was sick and dying. He had been coated with oil when he was found by this retired Brazilian bricklayer who took Dindim in. Show me the picture, Jackson. There he is. The retired Brazilian bricklayer, and I'm going to just refer to him as that because I can't say his Brazilian name, um, took him in. He washed him. He cleaned him. He fed him. He gave him a home. Literally, quite literally, he gave the little bird a new life. Eventually, the bird left to go off to go to the very southern part of Argentina, 8,000 mile, 8,000 kilometer journey. And everybody thought, well, that's the last they're going to see, and the man, the, the retired Brazilian bricklayer, uh, is going to ever see him. But amazingly, one year later, Dindim showed back up. And he came back, and as soon as this man there, show me the next picture, Jack. This man who lives right on the coast there near Costa Rica, uh, as soon as he saw him, the little bird went to squawking and Wagging its little tail, it immediately recognized this guy who had taken him in for a few months and cleaned him up and given him a new life. And, of course, it was exciting. The whole town was... But that little bird wouldn't have anything to do with anybody else. I mean, it wasn't as though he had become tamed and now is a people... No, just this one. Just the one man who took him in, cleaned him up, gave him new life. He came, he was there for a number of days and then left. But now every year... He comes back to this little harbor spot, and he makes that swim 8,000 kilometers each and every year. And every year, this man gets to see a little Dindim. Why? Because Dindim was a grateful and thankful penguin. Can I use the obvious illustration? We can learn a lot from a grateful penguin. 
huh? If that, if a, if a dumb bird <laughs> is smart enough to come back to the one who gave it new life, gave it a chance for life, then shouldn't we? Shouldn't we at least express our gratitude to the one who paid the sacrifice for our sin? At least more than once a year. That's a good point also. Yeah. Let's go quickly to Enoch's witness. Genesis chapter 5 and verse number 21. Enoch lived 65 years and he begot Methuselah. Anybody here 65 years old? Anybody 65 right in there? 67? How would you like to have a baby right now? Anyway. (laughs) 65 years and he got, begot Methuselah. And then after he begot, notice this, it's interesting to me in verse number 22. When did Enoch begin to walk with God? After he begot Methuselah, his son, Enoch walked with God. Kids will drive you to the Lord, won't they? <laughs> Kids will cause you to have to pray. Now, it's interesting because Methuselah's name means something. Methuselah uh, came, no, 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 give us that, back up. Methuselah, the words, the root words for Methuselah has the idea of to bring or to send forth. Um, and his name signifies his death shall bring. In other words, when he dies, it shall come. Methuselah's name means when he dies, it shall come. Enoch named his boy, when he dies, it's going to happen. So everybody knew as Enoch went through, as Methuselah, Enoch's son, went through life, whenever he dies, something's going to happen. Something big's going to happen. When he dies, look out. Can you imagine if Methuselah took to the extreme games? Hey, wait a minute, no, no, don't, don't, just relax, Methuselah. <laughs> no, 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 get down from there, Methuselah. Hey, sit down here, take it easy, put your feet up. We want you to live a long time, Methuselah, because when you die, it's going to happen. Nobody knew what the it was. Can I tell you what happened the year that Methuselah died? You get your calculator out and you begin to work through the years in which people were born and when they died. And, or if you read the screen real quickly before Jackson backed it up. The year that Methuselah died was the same year that Noah's flood came. The same year. God had to have spoken to Enoch's heart regarding what to name his boy. I don't think Enoch knew what was going to happen when Methuselah died. But God had spoken to Enoch's heart, and Enoch named his boy. When he dies, it's going to come. It's going to happen. Methuselah died the same year as the flood. Now, what do we know about Methuselah? Did he live a short life or a long life? Long life. We know that Methuselah lived 969 years. As far as records in the Bible There's no one that we have recorded life that lived any longer than that. What do we know about the flood? Was did the flood come because God was happy with the people upon the earth, or did the flood come because God was angry with the people upon the earth? A or B? B. Yeah, right. He was angry. So, what does the long life of Methuselah say about the character of God? I think it says he was very gracious, very long-suffering, very patient. The reason that you have a long life of Methuselah, I think, pictures the graciousness and the long-suffering of our God. Can I say to you, now, we know that every day that Enoch lived, um, that event was going to happen. And he got one day closer to the time when the flood was going to come. I might have to skip through my notes because I'm going to just run out of time. But we know that Enoch, though he didn't know what was going to happen, God had revealed to him something was going to happen. Every day he lived, he got one day closer. Can I tell you what a picture that is of the situation in which we live today? 
Every day you and I live, Christians, we are one day closer to when the judgment of the Lord comes. Now, we know the judgment of the Lord. The Bible says that Christ um, will come with, it, with the saints. Matter of fact, I want you to see what he said. Jude chapter 1. There's only one chapter in Jude. Jude 1, verses 14 and 15, the Bible says about Enoch. Now, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also saying. This is the only thing we know that Enoch ever said. Remember, we said that Abel never said anything. This is what we do know other than the fact we know he, he named his son Methuselah. This is what he said. Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. What is he prophesying there? He's prophesying the judgment day of the Lord, the coming judgment of the Lord. Behold, the Lord, wait a minute, this is Enoch, the seventh person from Adam. That's a long time ago. And he's prophesying about something that's yet to even happen in our lifetimes yet. Behold, the the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. So this is him coming with the saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against um, against him you get the idea there that it must have been an ungodly time he used the word four times in that in just those two verses there ungodly I would dare say that as we look around us that that is the picture of where we are today I like what I heard one preacher say. He said, I am no longer listening for the signs of the time. He was preaching on, on uh, the rapture. And he was preaching on how the Lord Jesus will come uh, with the sound of, the, uh, of a trump and the trump of the archangel. He said, I'm no longer looking for the signs of the time. I'm starting to listen for the sounds now. <laughs> and uh, and, I, and I, I, I think we could... I'm sure every preacher has said this in previous generations, but we do know that the rapture of the church is imminent. Instantly, and I only got just a few minutes, instantly Enoch was translated. He was raptured. He was taken having experienced no death. Instantly, that's what the rapture of the church will be. Instantly. In, the Bible says, in the twinkling of an eye, that fast. And just as the Bible says, and they could not find Enoch, there will be tens of thousands of people missing, maybe millions, hopefully millions of people missing. And they'll be looking, where is so-and-so? Where is so-and-so? Where is so-and-so? And, and great pandemonium will certainly break out upon the earth. But then the salt and life Salt and light, that's supposed to be you and I, that's been preserving and keeping this world, the evil and the wickedness and the decay at bay as much as it is today. If you can imagine how bad and how wicked the earth will be when all the Christians are gone. When, When there's no more light, spiritually speaking, when there's no more salt, Spiritually speaking, to preserve what's decent in this world today. If imagine all the Christians are suddenly gone, how evil and how wicked things will then be. Enoch was raptured. Genesis chapter 5, show me Jackson real quickly, verses 23 and 24. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. He was caught up. He was translated. Um, He was raptured. Why? Because he pleased God. How did he please God? With his what? With his faith. And why did God take him to heaven? To be with him. Precious in the eyes of the Lord are the death of his saints. I want to show you one more verse before we close. John chapter 14 and verses 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, Jesus said, I will come again 
And I will receive you to myself that where, notice this, key phrase, key phrase of why you're going to heaven. Why are you going to heaven? Why are, why are you given eternal life? Why, why do you, uh, what's the whole point of Calvary? That where I am, there you may be also. That's the reason it. Yeah. The reason is God desires to be with us. That's mind-boggling. I can't understand it, but it's reality. He desires to spend all of eternity with us. I don't even want to spend all of eternity with me. (laughs) I don't even get along with me that well. But God desires to spend all of eternity with you, with me. That where he is, there we may be also. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Enoch was and then wasn't. Was present and then was absent was translated, was raptured. Why? God wanted him with him. Before the Lord can come with his saints, he must first come for his saints. That's what we call the rapture. That's how we, one of the ways that we understand that the rapture is real, because the Bible talks at the judgment, that at the judgment day he comes with the saints. Well, the only way he can come with the saints is if he's come first for the saints. Seven years later, he comes with the saints. And that's the prophecy that, that, uh, that Enoch uh, spoke of that's recorded in Jude. That he's coming with the tens, th- tens of thousands of his saints. Um, there's a whole lot of interesting. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. And yet it tells us so many things about the last days. About things that haven't even happened in our lives. It's really a fascinating. It could not happen unless... Well, unless it's a God-inspired book, unless, unless there's something about that book that is for real. All of the prophecies of Christ were fulfilled perfectly when he came. All of the prophecies regarding Israel are being fulfilled perfectly. And just as God has fulfilled his prophecies about his, his son and about his people, he will fulfill his prophecies regarding when he returns. And the end of time. Um, sometimes it seems like a fairy tale. Sometimes it seems like a sci-fi movie. There have been movies on it. You've probably seen them. But the reality is, it's reality. It's for real. Lord, we ask that you would help it be real in our hearts and lives. Lord, help us to understand that, your rapt- that the rapture of the church, your return, is imminent. That it could happen even now, that there's nothing that has to precede your return for us. And Lord, that should make a difference in, in our lives. That should make a difference in how we know that you're there and how we live by faith, living and believing that, that you're involved in our lives and that you desire to be involved in our lives. Lord, help us to live in light of eternity, to live by faith. Thank you, Lord, for the truth of, and the, the hero of faith that we find in Enoch, that he pleased you by faith. Help us likewise, too, to live by faith. We ask your blessing, please, in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for your attention tonight. You are dismissed.